there with someone who can help you to program and visualize, analyze the data for the story. So if you have any questions, by the way, uh, you can ask them during the presentations. I come to you with the mic. We are live streaming this session, so if you don't want to be on the live stream, please don't ask any question. <laughs> and that's it. You can start. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, yeah, this is a very um, good picture of how we actually uh, work, although Helena doesn't uh, agree with it. Uh, we were the first hires uh, that Aaron Pilhofer, um, the current uh, chief digital officer and executive editor for digital, uh, uh, did when he moved from the New York Times to um, The Guardian. Uh, and we basically hit the ground running. We had um, the selection in May, and we had just landed uh, in London from uh, Washington DC and from Stockholm. Um, and that was our big test. And we had to put together a team of data editors, developers, a special project editor, and visualization editors to, um, to be able to come up with uh, some data stories. Yeah, so my part in this is the data, and the data for the elections was the polls. And we all know that they were wrong. <coughs> but if we stop thinking about the fact that they were wrong for a moment and think about that they were actually very great data, there was a lot of data there. So what we did, and that was also something to get used to, is Guardian is a Google, uh, uses Google tools. So I had to go into Google spreadsheets and gather data for the polls. So we had, we had an old data set about the old election from 2010. Um, that contained all the data from all the votes that had been going on in all 650 constituencies. We had the polls, and the res we had the result from 2010, the national result from 2010, and with those results, we did an amazing Excel formula uh, or a Google spreadsheet formula that concocted all this together and predicted what kind of result we were going to get in each constituency. The polls were wrong, but if we, you know. So this was the spreadsheet that then actually was the, the, was the foundation for what Shaquin and his team then did. So um, we decided that the most important view um, for, the, for the election uh, poll projection was the seat breakdown. And since it lacked, having just the seat breakdown lacked the, the element of change, it, you couldn't see, you basically couldn't see uh, the change in one or two. Uh, seats every day, uh, and we wanted people to come back to this uh, page. We, we added some uh, tiny little fun elements, like this is park lines, uh, this is small uh, visual devices that show uh, the trend. Uh, I think it was a month uh, worth of data for each, um, for each party, and um, then the element of context, who, was, who had the numbers to govern, because the polls were saying that nobody would have a majority. Again, Helen is right, wouldn't have, the polls were not right. Uh, we had the average of polls showing the percentage of popular vote, uh, and we included a, it's not very clear there, but we included the, the dot cloud as a way of displaying all the polls mm -hmm. that we had taken into account and effectively were showing their uh, bias. And then the transfer, the transfer of seats, which went on to becoming or signature visual for the for the election coverage, um, and our visualizations were all over the place uh, at the Guardian. Um, we had embeddable bits of the interactive, uh, sort of how's the party uh, doing today, and we used that data set to to power uh, things like our uh, coalition builder and our geographic display of the data set, our cartogram. Um, went on to serve the base uh, as the base for our election results, um, which this is how we roll at the Guardian during election night. Um, and it was the most read page of the site during the night. It was a very slow drip uh, in results. And it was prominent in, the, in our network front. Because it's 2015, 
it's not just uh, that it has to work on mobile, it has to be awesome. This one particularly uh, was incredible on the phone, and it's not an easy fit. Those of you that have ever programmed an interactive for the phone, it's not uh, easy to uh, turn it into something fun. And this was, this one particularly, the coalition builder was absolutely incredible uh, on, the, on the phone. And what we used to produce all these visualizations, uh, yeah, went from digital to, to print. We reused, uh, we crowbarred these SVGs, um, and we, all, we used all the views that we had of the slicing and dicing the, the, the election results um, for our print edition. So, <clears throat> so there's this story. When we have some time, for instance, we, we were looking at, we put together a team of the special project. This actually was an idea from, this, from one of the special projects editor because we were talking about China and how much China is affecting the world policy and the world trade. So I started as I do. The, the, the idea actually this time came from the visuals department, which I think is interesting. It, I went into this amazing database that shows all trade in the world. It's a UN database. You go in there and you start looking at what are the figures, if you look at China, import and export, and how have they changed. So we put in, sorry, a little quick there. Uh, so we put in China, we want everyone in the world, we want to look at everyone in the world, and we want to look at import and exports. So we get an Excel file where, where we get the trade value from all countries, but we want to compare that to something, of course. So we look at the World Bank, we go to the Data Bank of World Bank and look at the GDP numbers for all the countries. We put them together in a spreadsheet, and we start comparing them. And we also did some extra calculations on this. And still we're working in Google Spreadsheets, uh, looking at how the world will, how the tr GDP would change if the China figures went down. So, and then we make it visual. So Sean Clark, the special projects editor that um, had the idea for, for this interactive, uh, charted this in Excel. Um, or, well, no, uh, Google Spreadsheet, sorry. And um, Carlos Aponi, the, one of our data visualization experts, uh, immediately prototyped something uh, on, along the lines of what if China goes down and how would that affect uh, the countries that we selected in our analysis. It was simple and functional, it was just a slider, and you could see how it went uh, up or down depending on how much, uh, uh, depending on the projected uh, imports of, of China. But we were missing a few things. We were missing uh, geography. We thought it could be interesting to show some geography. So we started sketching and uh, some sort of cartogram. Uh, but in the process of, of doing that cartogram, we realized uh, we came up with this sort of visceral interface. What happens when you drag China down and how the different countries sync uh, at different speeds, and that's uh, uh, which the idea we went f uh, we went with. This again, uh, it's kind of an amazing um, interactive for the phone because you're with your thumb, you're uh, dragging China China down, and all the countries are sinking down too. Um, but we work in a newsroom, and sometimes uh, stuff happens. I was going to say another word for stuff, uh, and we need to respond fast uh, to give context to, to our readers. So when there was a racially motivated uh, terrorist attack in Charleston, South Carolina, we thought of visualizing uh, the context, the racial context of the city. So we went to Helena and said, uh, you know, so Helena, and she said, yes, I'm on it already. So, and that's the beauty, I think, and the, the, if you can take one point with you when you're going away, it's the fact that Shaquille just has to lift his head and say, Joe, Selena, actually. He doesn't have to walk to me, I'm sitting there next to him. And I think that that is one of the most important points, is that if you're going to do anything, you have to sit that close, because you have to be communicating constantly. So, after Joe, Selena, I, write, I went to the United States Census, which is an amazing database, where you can actually go 
and look at states. So in this case, we looked at South Carolina, of course. We go into Charleston, uh, and we go into Charleston, and we say we want every single census tract, which is basically a block. So we can look at Charleston on block level and see the racial um, composition of each block. So you can see here this very boring Excel table. Uh, and what I basically did was, because we want to calculate percentages, so I did a very small Excel calculation, and the if statement is only there because there are some blocks that doesn't have any people in them. Uh, so I did a small Excel statement, uh, calculated the percentage of, of blacks in each neighborhood in, in Charleston, and then I handed the data over to, to Shaquille, and this took 45 minutes an hour or something like yeah. that, maybe. Yeah, but it took very little time. We were, this was part of our breaking news visual Q&A. Uh, we needed to put, uh, we thought we had the need to, to put the racial tensions in, in context as, uh, as one of the, of the questions and answers. Uh, so we included a map visualizing what Elena had gathered, which is basically what's the, what's Charleston's uh, racial makeup. And we pointed to the fact that in 1980, in the church that uh, where the terrorist attack uh, happened lied in a mostly black uh, neighborhood, and now it was a mostly bla uh, black uh, neighborhood. White neighborhood. Oh, sorry, white neighborhood. Um, we were fast and first, but the New York Times that has uh, one of the, the places that has uh, perhaps the most amazing uh, visuals team in the world um, had the same idea. Uh, of adding uh, context to to this story, but displayed in a much better way. Basically, they had the before and after, the 1980 and 2010 uh, visuals. They used less gr uh, granular data. They used census tracts, which were uh, which are a little bit uh, bigger uh, than the block by block data that we had. Mm -hmm. um, but that data didn't exist for 19 uh, for 1980. They beat us in this, although we were fast and first, but their visualization was, uh, was much more clear. And finally, there's not usually that a data story starts with, I've found a database. You might think that, but it's actually very seldom that a data story starts with this. But I found this database. It had 19 million records of all the house sales in the UK from 1995 to uh, today, basically. So what we did was very quickly, I started looking at the data, but in the same time, I also started talking. I started talking to Shaquin, and I started talking to our developer about this data. Mm -hmm. And I started talking to the newsroom about the data. So the data was found here. It's a public data set. It, it's lying on a government website. It's not, I didn't even have to FOIA it. I just had to download it. And this is a little part of it that shows all the sales. It tells you basically how much people paid for a flat or a house. Uh, and the date, it doesn't tell me who did it, but for our data. But we were sort of struggling a little bit when it came to how to show this amazing data set because we didn't do, want to do 19 million dots on a map. We thought that, that would be a little boring and very hard to understand. So while talking to one of the reporters, we talked about he was going to do, one of the stories that we were going to do was about a family and the fact that when the family was when the parents were in their early 30s, they could easily buy a flat in the central of London. But now when their daughter was the same age, she, there was absolutely impossible for her and her partner to do the same thing. So I made a joke to the reporter and I said, well, they have to move up north then, like everybody. If we just move up north, everything will be fine. And he said, well, I'm not so sure about that. So what I did was that I pulled a second data set from the tax authorities with median income and I started comparing the media. I calculated the median price out of my gigantic database. And then I, I added on the median income. And then we could see that if you looked at 1995, the median house price was about three or four times the median salary, which is also the rule of thumb that the banks usually use to grant you a loan or not, to grant you a mortgage or not. But if you go up to 2012, actually the London rates had risen to 12 times, but the more astounding thing was that even up 
in the Northeast, it was six and a half times the median salary. So the house prices had risen much, much faster. So with those sort of thoughts, we started talking again about the visuals. Um, so it is kind of uh, straightforward, the, the visual, sort of. Um, if you think about it, it's not, it's not more than uh, an interactive map, uh, a gray one, really, really good one, uh, lots of little jewels on it, uh, very well thought. Uh, but um, we had a great angle to start with. It was where can you afford to buy a home based on your salary? So uh, we didn't want to add too many bells and whistles uh, to it, uh, but we wanted to be um, we wanted to be really, really clear uh, and really, really easy to uh, to navigate based on that. Uh, uh, where can you afford to buy your uh, a home based on your salary? For the cartography nerds, this had uh, uh, we had three levels of detail to create a more realistic uh, view of the data. Uh, we had the postcode uh, postcode boundaries. We had the build up areas and then the buildings, uh, sort of to give it a, a, a richer texture and. On hover uh, and on tap and on um, when you went to geolocate on your phone, we had the distribution of the sales in that postcode for that year, and uh, we had a little uh, fun thing: uh, how far back you had to travel in time uh, to be able to afford that um, that area, and it was all controlled by, by a very very tight piece of uh, of UI. It was just type your salary or check the national average of, or the minimal wage, and this uh, will um, customize, will, will personalize the view, and at the same time will change the, the background, the, the map in the background. Uh, very, very snappy, all due uh, to the brilliance of Will Franklin and uh, Apple uh, Chan for Delft, who were the two developers slash visual editors uh, in the project. But this was an interesting project because it, it really meant communicating. It meant communicating with, constantly communicating with the uh, developer to change the data so that it fit the, for instance, we had to do postcode districts so that we can do the postcode areas. So my job would then be to, we had all of a sudden we realized we had 30,000 postcodes that didn't have any, 30,000 sales that didn't have any postcodes. So Will comes to me and says, there's 30,000 postcodes missing. Can you do this? Yes, I can. And I go to him and say, could you please insert this into the database? So we constantly communicate. And s almost at the same time, we actually, well, actually, this was the main story, and that was written last. That was, was written almost when the visualization was done, so, which is also a good thing. So this is sort of the number story. We have the story about the family and how they, their daughter who can't get a house, and then we had the editorial, who uh, who's also an important point of this. So it was the whole newsroom working together on the story. And what Helena was saying uh, right there is a little bit the idea behind the way we operate is the constant checking with each other on the progress of the of the story of the idea, kind of like the Barca uh, <laughs> plays football. Uh, is a tiki tac is the moving the ball around, is the to to build the play, um, and to finally score. We uh, Helena comes with the data, uh, then it passes on to Will, then to Apple, then to me, then to Helena, then to me, then to Apple, then to Will. Uh, in a to sort of a then, then to the newsroom, <laughs> uh, in a in a very casual way. Nobody is the sole keeper of of it, of the story, or th of the idea, of the of the data. We're all fully invested in the story and everyone cares deeply uh, about the piece. It's kind of, the story is at the, at the center. Uh, in 1943, uh, Disney introduced an organizational uh, chart that showcased how the company operated and everything emanated from, from the story. All the operations were in service of the story. They broke the silos that the company had uh, which is kind of what the visuals and the data projects team are, are about. They're, they're a way to de-silo those projects, forcing collaborations between people like Helena and me uh, with different backgrounds. Uh, journalists who want, to, who want to be programmers and programmers who uh, want to be uh, 
uh, journalists, uh, fine arts people that are incredible map makers and, and programmers and 3D and, uh, and D3 uh, experts all under the same uh, roof. Thank you. <laughs> so Thank you. One question to you before we continue to Mar and Rico. You can set up your presentation yeah. probably in the meanwhile. Um, you're all from different backgrounds. Do you all agree on what the story should be when you have such a data set? Well, not to start with because that would be a really boring story. I mean, the good story comes out of that we disagree, actually. So it's true, but it's, it's very, for me, it's very, very important. I come back to the communicating again. When we start communicating about this and when we come from different backgrounds, we actually also enrich the story because as a journalist, I could actually talk to another journalist and for, from the journalistic perspective, we could be very sort of in agreement on what the story is. But a person with Chakin's background could have a totally different way into the story, which actually could make it a better story, if I'm honest. Uh, and that sort of thing. Can you give an example of that? Um, can I give an example of that? I think that there, oh, I think that this house prices story is a good story because I started with the boring stuff. I started with the top most expensive places in the in the UK and 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 you know the the kind of stories that you want to do as a journalist. And Shaquille then talked about um, this is a very big and rich. Yeah, I think I think it was Apple who who actually. Uh, nailed the idea of, uh, between Apple and Will, nailed the idea of- Who what are they? Uh, they're the two of the, the developer slash visual editors in the, that work in this, yeah. in this project. Um, they, th I, think, I think they were, they were talking about like how to approach this and, and they came with the, with the they narrowed the, the angle of what if we turn this into a uh, customizable uh, map mm -hmm. and it all, uh, mm -hmm. rotates around the fact that you can enter your uh, your salary and everything changes depending on your salary. And I actually think that was Will who said, I can't afford to live anywhere. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's young Ouch. and he, you know. Yeah. Well, Ouch. That was very painful for yeah. me as his boss. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> let's continue with your presentation. Great. So here's where you see, can you hear me? Yeah? So here's where you see the visuals people <laughs> and the not so visual person doing a presentation. <laughs> I'm gonna hire Shakina as my presentation <laughs> editor uh, next time. Uh, so basically both Rigo and I work at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. The ICIJ is a bit different or very different to The Guardian in that we are a nonprofit media organization that dedicates most of its year to one or two projects. So we don't have to deal with daily work. We don't have to deal with breaking news. We just have to think of one or two big projects a year. That doesn't mean that we don't do a lot of work and that we have daily deliveries. I remember when Rigo joined the ICIJ he, and he was coming from a paper, a uh, newspaper in Costa Rica and he told me, Mar, I'm having more deadlines than in Costa Rica <laughs> when I used to work at a paper. But it's a different pace and it allows us to work in a different way. If you want to follow the presentation, you can always go to the URL there. And it also means that our structure is different. We're much more smaller, uh, but also it's a, the, a different way of working. We have one, two, or maybe three ongoing projects. So we need to be up to date on what the ongoing projects are and what the needs are. We have one challenge, which is that our team is not in the same place. So that yo Elena moment <laughs> is not that easy to have when you have your team between France, Venezuela, Greece, Costa Rica, and Spain and Washington. So we communicate a lot through technology. We have Skype open all the time. We're actually now experimenting on using Slack to communicate with each other and be there all the time to have those yo Elena moments that they have. Um, but it's also another challenge is that we are not working at the same times, right? I start, I actually adapted my schedule to 
go more with Rigo. So I would start work maybe around 2 p.m. or so. Rigo actually wakes up and starts working around 5 p.m. my time in Spain. So, and then sometimes, I, because I have no social life, <laughs> I work until midnight to actually be with Rigo uh, and the other reporters in the team that are in, in, in the United States or in America. So um, the way we work is I consider myself, I'm the editor of the unit, and part of my role is to be there to be a uh, bodyguard um, that you know, basically protects my team from silly small tasks that a reporter has an idea and thinks that he or she needs that minute. Uh, so I'm a bodyguard, uh, and I'm also uh, the person that is also having a lot of boring meetings to see what, how things are going, to also get the needs from the people that are working in the project and maybe assignate uh, resources. I also have some creative tasks too, but uh, I basically, that's why I've put there like a funnel because a lot of the work I do is kind of like funneling needs and trying to distribute them. So that's why I say that sometimes a lot of my work is as an air controller um, so that, you know, we all work um, uh, kind of like in coordination. We can, uh, as you can see there, we, our team, we're only five people, although we're six people now. We have another programmer working with us. Um, we have, we can either be embedded in a project like any other journalist. So it could have be a data journalist like Cecile and Rigo, who's a data analyst embedded as one more reporter, but having a different angle, like Helena was saying, like you are working with somebody that has a different way of viewing things than you. Uh, or we could also help in very specific tasks within uh, uh, a project. So we could help enhancing the reporting, gathering research. We could also do gathering data that will kind of like allow us to talk systematically about an issue. Or we can help in the publication side of things like doing interactive applications or some visualizations, right? Um, by the way, the ICIJ data unit didn't exist a year and a half ago. And today we are almost 50% of the ICIJ staff. So that also speaks of the uh, growing need of having teams like this. Uh, and I am half of the unit are programmers, right? Um, they, we didn't have any programmers before or any people with programming background or data specific data knowledge. The goal of the unit, and I think having a mission statement is always good, is our goal is to add a data component to every project ICIJ does, but from the beginning and not as an afterthought. Uh, we came, um, in one of our biggest projects uh, in 2013 was one of the big leaks that we did uh, from uh, the offshore world. Um, we decided that we wanted to do, because it was cool and it was important for the story to speak about transparency and how tax havens need to be transparent, that we needed to publish information about tax havens in a searchable registry, right? Um, after that interactive application, which you can see in offshoreleaks.icij.org, Everybody, every project manager at ICIJ wanted an interactive application in their story, right? Uh, but they came to us sometimes at the end saying, hey, we have one month to publication. Uh, can we have some data interactive? Um, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> it took us many months to gather data for like the interactive that we published. So we really need to think of data from the beginning even if we don't want to publish and it's just for the reporting, like it's something that needs to be there when you plan the project or as we go out, you have it on my, in mind all the time as you go along. So the way we work is we could either enhance, again, day-to-day -day projects, quote unquote, <laughs> uh, but la our long projects, accelerating the projects by doing some scraping, focusing the reporting by doing analysis, helping the projects to better transmit a story through visualizations or apps, we also create tools that help projects, and we'll talk more about that, internal tools for the team. Uh, we also hope to uh, start producing projects of our own. Uh, and something that we do a lot is gather data from the members. Uh, the most recent projects that we have done at ICIJ originated with data from members of the ICIJ team. So for example, we did a story called Swiss Leaks that was a leak on bank account information from HSBC, which is one of the biggest banks in the world. That originated from Le Monde, the newspaper Le Monde that came to us. And then we had to kind of like establish a global investigation. So we have to deal a lot with data that is not ours and we have to verify it, we have to recreate databases, etc. Because we are all in different parts of the globe, we 
rely a lot on project management tools like these, the ones that you're seeing here. We also use InVision for like prototyping of interactive applications and visuals. And for the code, it's, you know, uh, the regular uh, places. We were in Bitbucket before we got upgraded into GitHub for free. Uh, so now we can have teams in GitHub because money is very important in places like us, ours, where, you know, we're a small nonprofit organization. Um, so we want to share with you three examples of our work and how we interacted together and how would that workflow work, right? So one of the goals for us in one of the projects was called Luxembourg Leaks, where we were dealing with the leak of secretive tax agreements um, that were done between multinational corporations and the Luxembourg government was we want to get our reporters, oh no, the, no we're going to talk about Swiss leaks, no, sorry. So some of the goals that we have to deal with, the first goal would be, for example, get our reporters to search and work with the data. So we would get a leak of secretive tax agreements, or we would get a leak of, for example, um, documents uh, from the HSBC that said who had bank accounts in Switzerland. So. We get documents that we don't know, but we need to build a team of hundreds of reporters working together, right? So how do we do that? Because when I get a, like a, for example, in the case of Swiss Leaks, we got a flash drive that it was around four gigabytes. And what I first did is, Rigo, I have a flash drive with data. How can we make this available to our reporters uh, in everywhere in the world? Because we build teams all around the globe, not just the team that you saw here, but hundreds of reporters uh, all around the globe. Yeah. Um, the thing is that, well, we receive the leak, but we don't, we do not share all the, um, only the data uh, to the to the reporters. We add value to the data uh, with some uh, ideas and some processes that uh, the data team um, runs. For example, with the Swiss for the Swissleak project, uh, we receive a, a list of Excel files. Um, and we had to extract the data from the Excel files because because it they don't they had um, we are a structure that um, it is not useful, so we had to extract this data to normalize it uh, to clean it. We had we had to de duplicate some um, values for addresses and, and names. Um, and something that it is very useful to journalists is that. They had a huge data set, but they they had to work on on their local news. But how they how they can do that? Um, for that, we we run processes to um, lo uh, localize the data, the names. So we recognize the countries for each name. Uh, using all the fields available and all the APIs available. And we create lists for each um, country and so, so the journalists can work on the data related to um, their own country. Right, because uh, some background, like at the ICIJ, which I think I've missed this point, and I think it's important to understand that we have our own team, we have 11 people working, uh, we have the data team, and we are being paid by ICIJ, right? But then we team up with people from The Guardian, and then we team up from people from Le Monde, and then we team up with people from the Indian Express in India. So we built a team of newsrooms working together on projects. So that's why our first customers are not the readers, are the other reporters from other newsrooms that actually have to work with the data to get stories out. Exactly. Um, also, an interesting and useful service that we bring, um, that we give to to the journalists, is the are the the matches. Uh, we have some tools to find matches with uh, um, with sets like Wikipedia, for example. Uh, we 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 find fussy matches uh, fussy matches um, between our date our leak and the uh, Wikipedia and other interesting uh, data set that we have. Um, so that work that Rico's describing is done yep. by programmers and yep. also some data journalists, right? But you had to, in this case, Rigo, you also had to extract the information and recreate a database, no? Yeah, yeah we, have, we had to, 
we had to recreate the database. We, we, we call it uh, reverse engineering because um, the database uh, was exported in this um, unuseful format and we had to recreate the original database. Uh, so for that we had to understand how, how the fields are connected and the entities um, and this way uh, the data basically is going to be are going to be uh, more useful. Um, and finally, we, we generate uh, figures and stats, interesting uh, stats for the for the for the final publications that are used by all the members um, uh, for um, for their their own um, publication. But remember, our main challenge is how do I get the Guardian people to be able to search the data? So that's what you'll see in the next slide. Yeah, that is a, <laughs> a really big challenge. So um, we had we had a lot of tools that allows them to look uh, uh, look into the data. Um, for example, we have um, Blacklight. That is a platform that allows them to search uh, uh, with full text. Do, um, do full text searches um, so uh, all the journalists can can search their names or whatever in 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 this platform in the old data set that we have we had we we for that project also we use the Incurious that is a, um, an application to explore the data in a graph way uh, with graph visualizations like like that one, it is not clear, but um, but it it allows allows the journalist to understand um, easily how the de how the how the person and companies and addresses are connected. Um, this is very very uh, useful a useful tool. And finally, also we have a um, like a Facebook. <laughs> It is a, it is like a Facebook, but it it acts like like a virtual newsroom because all the all the journalists uh, interact between them and and collaborate and and this is very very um, interesting because I love I love them to uh, to share uh, the knowledge their 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 findings and that is um, amazing. So before we move into the next goal, yeah. yeah, no, it's fine. And before we move to the into the next goal, as you can see, we started talking not so much about stories, but about software. And uh, one of the roles that we're fulfilling at the data unit at ICIJ is we're a small software building company. We Most of the tools that you see here are actually um, open source software or software that we have got the license for free, like in the case of Lincurius. And in that case, the work with the journalists in our team, so whenever we have journalists from The Guardian or Le Monde or other newsrooms, is they help us improve the product, right? So we have users real time that are helping us improve the product because they say, hey, I want uh, to be able to do this. So they're making feature requests live as we go along. And also from the data unit perspective, we also have to do a lot of what it's called in software development QA. So we have to do a lot of quality, quality assessment that what we're putting out, um, the data that we're putting out is actually correct before we give it to so many journalists. So, but we don't do software development all the time. We also do stories. So one of our goals too is like try to get a better story from the data angle, right? So here's what we're going to tell you about what we did in Looks Leaks. This was the investigation that I was mentioning about how uh, we got secretive tax agreements from multinational corporations and the Luxembourg government. Um, it would, um, they would look something like this, so a lot of documents and structured data. So in this case, I would also go to Rigo or to Matthew, and I actually went and said, hey, what is it, it that we can do with these documents? Can we extract the information and create a great database uh, in an automated way? Uh, but unfortunately, we couldn't, so we had to resort to uh, a great technique, which is humans inputting data manually. Uh, so part of the team, Emilia, the research editor, and um, uh, myself and other people in the team had to actually go document one by one, structuring information into a Google spreadsheet um, so that we could also do 
and talk systematically about what was happening on those with those agreements, right? So we had to do a lot of verification. We cross-checked with Luxembourg public records and company records, looked at whether there were signatures or not, and we also added some value, like classifying the types of companies per industry, so that, that we could later actually have bigger, I mean, systematic amounts in the, in the story, find trends, find new stories, and we could also later build an interactive. So the same way that Helena would go into a public database and download the data and then talk to Shaquin, in order for, uh, for us to do that, we had to manually uh, create this database. But there were other things that we could do, and then while we were doing the research, I saw that the Luxembourg Corporate Registry was partially open. So whenever I see something open, I'm like, huh, what is, it, what is it that we can do with it? And we really wanted to prove that Luxembourg was a tax haven. Because even though it's not recognized by the OECD or other international organizations as a tax haven, it is a tax haven. And that was what the story was about, right? How all these multinational corporations set up companies that are just there to pay less tax, right? Um, so basically, one of the ways to show that a place is a tax haven is by looking at how many incorporations you have within the same address, right? So the typical thing is you go to the Bahamas and you find, you know, the building that has 2,000 companies incorporated in the same building. So we wanted to see whether that was true in Luxembourg. So I saw that the corporate registry had addresses and I went to Rigo and I said, Rigo, Rigo, there are addresses here. What can we do? Can you scrape this? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> we can scrape huh. this. And, and then I go to Mar and say, Mar, what fields do you need here? And Mar prepares a screenshot like this, saying the, I need this information, this information, take care with this one, and, and so on. So the next st step is to scrape the, the data. <laughs> and what, and so. Yeah, so we uh, convert all these websites into the, uh, data, um, a data set like this one, when, when we have the, um, the company names and the addresses, and we had to also uh, apply some the duplications here because y you know that the addresses um, sometimes are, are, dif are different, but ad they are the same address, so uh, it was very important to, to the duplicate to recognize uh, the same addresses in this record explain us why. Yeah, because the, the thing is like, even if it's inputted into a database in the corporate registry, they, they, I don't know how they do it, but like the addresses are dirty, right? So basically, uh, it, like the same address, 67 Boulevard Grand Duchesse, Charlotte, was written in many different times. Sometimes it was Coma Luxembourg, sometimes it's Pipe Luxembourg, sometimes they had the postcode and Luxembourg, sometimes it's Luxembourg and the postcode. So it's a bit of a, it was a bit of a mess, right? But we really wanted to see, again, whether the SIM building had many companies incorporated. So we had to do um, some cleaning and that was some work that was then mainly done by me. So Rigo kicked the database to me, I cleaned it and then kick it back to him and said, let's check the data together. So he came up with a number, I came up with the same number. Sometimes we disagreed, so it would also help us to see whether we are doing the same thing, like we were doing the same thing or who was wrong because uh, cleaning is not, it's a dirty process. But in the end, the manual work that we did with that spreadsheet and the work that we did with the aggregation of addresses helped us have a better story. So that was our lead story that was later distributed to partners about how leaked documents exposed how global companies were having secretive tax deals in Luxembourg. We would have paragraphs like the one you're seeing here that we only had data about the money funneled through Luxembourg in one out of three every three documents, but only having data in one of every three documents, we're talking about 215 billion invested in Luxembourg <laughs> through these deals. So we're talking about um, the GDP, a bit less than the GDP of Portugal. And we also had very powerful uh, paragraphs like this, where we would actually say, well, Luxembourg is not recognized as a tax haven, but an office in Luxembourg can just be a mailbox because we found through that analysis and that cleaning and scraping of the, day of the registry that there are um, streets like Rue Guillaume Kroll, the street Guillaume Kroll number five, where there were active at the time of the scraping more than 1,600 <coughs> companies. Of course, we combined that with the regular reporting and we sent our reporter there and that's how that street looks like. Um, it's a big building, 
I don't know if it's as big of a building as for having 1,600 companies, but for having 1,600 companies, it seems like <coughs> they have an awful lot of empty parking space um, in, that, in that place, right? So probably they don't have that many employees going, right? Probably your, your companies are smaller and you still have problems parking every day when you go there, right? So we combined the work uh, that we could do manually and put in data, combined with uh, automatic scraping, combined with regular reporting, and came up with what I think is a great story. And to end, basically, we also wanted to share with you uh, one of the goals um, that we've tried to achieve or one of the issues we've tried to deal with is we also want to expose data to the public, right? So we have a visualization angle in everything we do. Uh, people really love visuals. People understand data better through visuals. So we have to um, also do it. So in every single project, we try to think, what's the best story we can tell with the data? Or what is the best thing we can do with the data? And sometimes it's a public service, like creating a searchable database, like in the case of offshore leaks. Um, sometimes we cannot publish all the names that we have received in a leak on all the names that we have gathered through public sources. So in the case of Swiss leaks, we were dealing with information from 100,000 um, clients from a bank in Switzerland. It is not illegal to have a bank account in Switzerland unless you don't report it to the tax authorities. But that information is impossible for us to figure it out. So we ha had to think, okay, how can we creatively think of what, how can we best exploit the data that we have so that people can have some sense of what is in the leak? So we came up with the idea of like exploiting statistics out of those, uh, out of the leak. And that's where Rigo um, started analyzing the data, uh, not so much from a data analysis perspective, but from the data visual analysis perspective. Yes, this is, this is a task called um, data profiling uh, that allows, uh, allowed us to understand the data and how, how the field, um, the completeness of the field and, and duplication and, um, and if there are some new, uh, how many new values there, there are and how they are distributed in the time and, and so on. So um, we, we, we ex executed this report uh, in order to um, be come up with a, a, new, a good visualization that, um, that we're going to be sure that it's going gonna, it's gonna to have um, complete data and interesting data. Because like the questions would be like, I would see in the data, I would see it feel like, oh, we have the nationality of the people that had a bank account in Switzerland. Or I would see in the data that, you know, um, there would be people that we had actually professions. And actually through regular analysis, we saw that one of the most common professions in the data, whenever that field was um, fulfilled, was housewife, right? And we actually did a story about the housewives of HSBC. But um, through visuals, we were able to see the holes in the data and see whether it was representative or not. Because, you know, if we have uh, profession information, but it's only there in like one third of the cases, do we really want to give a statistic about all the, like, you know, 50% of the people connected to Spain are housewives? Well, maybe not, because it's not really representative, right? So we really had to understand uh, what were the holes in the data to be able to see the completeness of it and what is it that we can associate with each country. Yes. And then that y we use that for the interactive application then. So when we decided to do an interactive application and the idea was, let's try to give statistics uh, of uh, this leak in connection to some countries, uh, Thanks to that visual work that Rigo did from an internal level, level, we were able to decide which graphics to show. We were able to decide which, you know, which were the fields that actually made sense, how much money. Uh, we also uh, wanted to say how many clients and so on. And that was all led with um, graphics um, to decide after we've decided what was the best representation um, for those countries. And with that, I think we uh, run a bit over time, and we are ready for questions. Thank you. Yeah, we have some 10 more minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what I was wondering, actually, is if I summarize your presentations for journalists who have never worked with programmers, it's like you have to sit together with your programmer and the data journalist, or at least try to live in the same time zone. Yeah. Or change your life pattern and you have to uh, involve the programmer in your investigation from the beginning. Am I right? 
No, I mean, I think we are humans and we need to communicate. And I think that it's a creative work, right? So there's a lot of like tiki taka. Uh, I like the tiki taka <laughs> expression that um, the soccer comparison, right? And it's not like I give it to Rigo and Rigo comes up with something completely done. You know, whenever we work together, there are questions, there are follow up questions, there are like, hi, I found this. So I, I don't know if you have to change your habits of life. You can also have a personal life. It's just, uh, uh, but. Um, I think that it's very important to communicate, and in order to communicate in a fast and easy way, it's many times easier if you're in this working at the same time. Is it also easier to communicate with someone who also knows how to code or to who has some experience in programming or knows something about it, or can you communicate with everyone who is just <laughs> interested in making a visual or making a database? Yeah, it is hard in both ways, but um, uh, both parts have to um, make an effort to, to communicate. They, they have to learn the language of the older one. So uh, Mar has learned a lot of, of the technical concepts and I have learned a lot of, of about journalism. So the, um, this, is, this is the magic that happens when they work together, journalists and, and programmers that um, both can learn from the from the other. Although I would say there are like two levels of communications between journalists, and that's what I I think that that's why I describe my role as an air controller. Sometimes is I think the level of communication that the programmers in the data team and the journalists in the data team can have uh, is a different level of communication that what other journalists. Uh, in the newsroom can have. So in the end, in ICIJ, we have 11 people, and we have very traditional investigative reporters that are great at what they do. They, have, they find great stories, but sometimes they don't understand that data is not a number. So like, for example, we had an investigation about the World Bank where we gathered public data, and we shipped it through records of the World Bank in public website, and we counted for every single person that had been displaced by a World Bank-funded project. Um, it was a lot of my work was educational work to show the reporters that even though they wanted to come up with a figure of the 3.4 million displaced, getting that figure involved a lot of like shifting through records, creating a database, like they couldn't under like they couldn't understand the process. So I think that when you're not communicating with people that understand data, also like Helena or like me, there's also a lot of evangelism. Do you say yeah. Yeah. evangelism yeah. of like no, data is not a figure. Let me explain how it works, and let me um, like explain the process. And and y there's a lot of like educational uh, conversation. So I would say there are two levels of communication. Um, yeah, and that's why I guess. In, or I mean, I guess this is a biased opinion because I'm talking about my job. But I think in the case of the ICIJ in the past year and a half, it's been very helpful to have a translator. Uh, and that's what some people have told me. It's like, thank God, Mar, that sometimes you were there to translate because sometimes Rigo comes with this great idea. Um, and I, even me, have a hard time understanding what the idea is about. So imagine the people that have no idea about data, right? Uh, the other day he came up with an idea, but like statistical analysis that would show how much like a jurisdiction was used and like the, re the report, and he sent it directly to the reporters and the report answers were like, uh, can you help me read this document that you sent? So um, there's several levels of communication, if that makes sense. But I also think it's, um, it's important to think about, to think it, especially in larger media organizations like the media organization I come from, they sort of, there's very easy that you, did, that you divide, you have the digital development and the IT departments that's usually on another floor or in another building, and then you have the journalists in the newsroom and sometimes even if you have journalists like me who do a little bit of coding uh, and know a little bit of analysis, but the, the company wants to keep the newsroom separate from the IT department. So <laughs> if we want to do an application, the thought with them is that, yeah, you make, it, you make a order to the IT department and say, we want to do an application where we, for instance, uh, show all the schools in Sweden. So I gather the data and the thought is that I send the data up to the IT department they work for three months and then they send the application back. That is crap. That doesn't work. It, it, it will be a, and also news organization, news doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like we, 
we have something and three months later we get something back. News is a day-to-day, -day. even when you do longer projects, as now Mara said, even then when you do a project that maybe goes over three months, it's a day-to-day -day because the world constantly changes and when you have to both the person who are working on their application and me who are working on the data has to change with the world and that's really important. We have to say, you have to have the Joe, Helena. You can do that over Slack, that's totally fine, but you have to be in daily communication. So if somebody's sleeping, that makes it more, that makes it harder. You cannot have Slack communication when somebody's sleeping yet. But you sleep? <laughs> I, I sleep sometimes only. Yeah. <laughs> have any other questions in the audience? Okay, I'm coming to you. <coughs> Maybe with the mic. Yes, please introduce yourself first. Hi, I'm Rachel from the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in London. Um, I've just been in uh, David Donald's um, session about statistics. Um, do you think that perhaps the real magical team would include a statistician? Or, or do you think you, not need, you don't need that? Oh, uh, absolutely. I, I think it abs absolutely needs uh, statisticians. If not statisticians as, uh, like, that have been uh, trained as statisticians, people that have been um, at work for so long treating statistics that sort of do behave as statisticians. I think, I think that, I, I think in my old team, we actually have a statistician on the team, which actually helps in some projects. In some projects, it makes the projects much more compli complicated <laughs> than they <laughs> should be. Uh, <laughs> she's not here, so I can say this. Uh, it's being recorded. <laughs> yeah, it is recorded, and she's at the conference. Uh, but I do think that knowledge about how statistics work and how how to do a statistical analysis, but it's very important to remember that data journalism is not statistics. And there's, I think that that's one of the most common thoughts is that we all deal in numbers and statistics. I think that statistics is the most boring form of data journalism ever. Uh, so yes, sometimes you do data journalism out of statistics, but if I can, I don't. But I mean, I would say it depends on the needs of your organization and it depends on the type of work you do. I think that in order to make the title catchy for this talk, we summarized it in journalists and programmers, but I think the spectrum is much wider. Right, yeah. And I think that, um, that one thing that I really like about having Rigo in the team, we're calling him programmer. And yes, he studied it. he's an engineer in computer science, but he's an expert in, uh, in, in data mining uh, from you know from the business intelligence perspective and that's great to have him because he adds in in our case that's actually great so it's kind of like an a, a, a variation of the statistician right so mm -hmm. having a business analyst in the team actually helps a lot and no? it would be it would be a person that just uh, bounces the ball uh, around it would be just another member of the team it would be it wouldn't be someone that rules whatever we we do regarding numbers uh, I think we would like, if we have an statistician in our team, we would just bounce ideas off uh, that person. It's never, uh, it's never one single person's role to, to come up with, uh, with the stories behind the numbers. And I also think that it's really important because you, you hear when we talk, Mar and I, we're journalists, but we know some programming, some coding, some technical knowledge, and we are interested in knowing more the developers and, and, and graphical designers that I work with are excellent in what they do, but they also have a genuine interest in journalism. And that's sort of, you can have, I think that that is one of the reasons why this is working, things that we're doing, is that we work with people who constantly want to learn more about what I do. And I have, in the same way, have to have a real interest in learning more from my coworkers, who I, because otherwise I can't pass the ball in the right way. Any other questions? No. John, no? you want to add no. something? It's okay. To that? I just want to wrap up with, uh, with the last question to all of you. Just in short, give me... Um, that way, you can start that way. Okay, I start that way, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> For you, uh, can you give me some small advice if I want to start working with a programmer? What would be your main advice to me? Oh, treat him as a peer. Don't think that you are, um, that you're, you're both at the same level. Don't think that you're here and he's here. That would be my first advice. Yeah, I would say this is my uh, this is my sole advice. 
fight. Actually, actually, yes, fight. Because we can have polite discussions about what we're going to do. When we have polite discussions, we don't get to the core. The best work I've done was with a developer in Sweden that I thought was the stupidest thing I've ever met the first time I met him. And I didn't know why I had to work with this very strange person who had these strange ideas about things. We had a number of fights. There was screaming involved. And after that, he is the best person. I would work with him anytime, anywhere, in any country. And I think that actually to get to the core, to understand each other, to start treating each other as peers, because that's what you do also when you start fighting. So my advice is talk, of course, but if talk doesn't work, fight. Rigoberto? <laughs> okay, uh, well, I have, I would say that you as a journalist have to transmit your passion to the, to the programmers because, um, I don't know, I, maybe if you have tried, um, we used to work from eight to five, um, and we like our work, back, but now I understand how rewarding and challenging the journalism is. Um, and um, I didn't knew this before. And I learned the, your passion for this work, uh, working with you. Uh, so I had to I had to learn that and and the people with, with I started working uh, did that so I learned to love the journalism because of them so the, uh, you have to you have to transmit your passion to the to the programmers and also you have to as I say before you have to make an effort to and uh, to learn their language <laughs> because you have to communicate and it will be easier for both if if the if you can if, um, get this um what was the other one okay the uh, skills when we are recruiting uh, skills uh, recruiting programmers we some uh, we check their resume and we we are looking for a programmer with this, uh, with knowledge in this language programming, um, programming language and these skills and these other skills. But I think that this is not the most important thing. Uh, you have to find a programmer with um, that it is gonna is good in solving problems and learning new tools because the tools and languages uh, changes all the time and and he has to, they has to be able to learn and uh, to continue learning and 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 very fast so i think that there, these are the most important thing things um when you are recruiting a, um, a programmer and and yeah <laughs> You, Mark? Great. So, I mean, I, to me, what has been very helpful when working with a programmer is to do explain the why. I think that uh, many of the programmers that I've worked with love challenges. So, if you pose a challenge and explain why, so I think it, when I've had the best results, it's not when I go and I say, do this, 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 and that, because I have no freaking clue. But, like, I'm like, hey, Rigo, there's this. Corporate registry, it seems amazing. What if we could aggregate, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the addresses, right? So it's more, more like explain what the goal is and explain the why, like why it is important, and then allow for the creativity to happen, right? I think that whenever I've gone with something very detailed on how to do things, I've failed. So, but I think in that process, it's very important to explain certain things and explain that uh, how the journalism works. At the beginning, I had a lot of clashes when working with, with programmers because I would always ask the question, so when, is, when can you have this? And the programmers would tell me, I cannot k tell you when. And I'm like, no, I, <laughs> this cannot happen. You know, I need to know if it's going to be by the deadline or not, you know, because if not, we need to adapt, right? So um, there's a lot of explanation on, on to what is the minimum viable thing we can do, uh, what, uh, how can we do it? So a lot of explanation into how the process works and what it would, what do we want to achieve, right? So I think that explaining the why, taking it, making it as a challenge, and explaining, yeah, that goal and how do we need to achieve it is very important in order to uh, to get things done. Um, 
And then, then there are some cultural clashes. And, and you, like, there are some programmers that speak less and some programmers that speak more. Uh, you know, so, you know, like, sometimes you have to also adapt, right? There are, like, whenever the programmers in the team speak to each other, they speak in, to, in the chat. And I'm a talking person. So, like, there are also cultural clashes that you have to understand and adapt to them. So I chat more instead of talk sometimes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. If people want to ask more questions to you, can they approach you in the bar or? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On the chat, probably. <laughs> Only on chat. Slack, please. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.